All right, so I took care of that. This is Todd Atkins, and I'm back, and I'm going to be going live with uh, Luca Dizubina. And, uh, again, he's a documentary filmmaker in the MMA space. So uh, this is first time using Instagram Live, so let's see if we can get him in here first. What's up, Luca? I sent you the invite. If you accept it, it'll bring you in. Give me just one moment. Basically, what's doing is I think you requested to join right as I was inviting you. So I'll wait for it to clear here right quick. Okay. Okay, now it should work. Now request to join, Luca. All right, so just see your invite. So just go ahead and uh, accept it. Uh, I'll come back here in just a moment. Oh, all right. Okay, Luca. Yeah, you got me. All right, so I think I'm on finally. Can you hear me yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you real good. Cool. Um, cool, cool. So <clears throat> I kind of came across your stuff, or someone suggested I talk to you, actually. And uh, Okay. So I kind of wanted to ask you, for anyone who's watching something that's familiar with you, maybe you can introduce yourself and talk a little bit about how you got introduced to this sport. Um. Yeah, so uh, basically I'm – I, th I think in relation to what you want to talk about, I'm uh, the last film that I produced, which was After the Cage. Um, it revolved, um, basically it involved different fighters. Some of them uh, who had retired, Matt Hughes is featured in there, Dan the Beast Sever and Pat Miletic is in there, Jason Reinhardt and also current fighters. Uh, my background in fighting, basically I was just an amateur boxer. I trained with uh, Kung Fu and a couple other things. I'm ex-military also, but I was in the Air Force, so that sort of doesn't really count, right? <laughs> and... Um, I suffered an injury when I was in the military. And so that sort of made it where um, I like I, I knew that my fighting days or even training days were over pretty much. So it's like, how would I stay current coming out? I got out in 2010. I moved to the Bay Area in Northern California and I started uh, like working for the Boxing Network basically and going and covering fights there and in Vegas and in other places, right? So it's allowed me to sort of, I, I think, take an active, I guess, backseat um, to not fighting myself, but supporting it in some sort of ways because I do support so many different fighters. Uh, and, and by the same token, also um, being able to stay sort of uh, current with, with things that are going on, right? Right. Now, <clears throat> what made you, because not everyone gets into it to the level that you did, what made you want to be involved like with filmmaking part of it? Were you close to some of these guys before or something? I wouldn't say I was close to any of them. I mean, um, I, I, I didn't, everybody I've met since after the fact, like, you know, when I showed up in California, like none of the fighters on the undercards there knew me. Um, but when I started going to people's gyms and I started um, filming them, of course, boxers trained with other boxers. And so it wasn't uncommon with some of the guys to basically have other fighters that they would train with that were either getting ready for a championship bout or be a sparring partner for somebody who was a champion, right? And... You sort of just, um, you know, work your way around, I guess. And your name gets around. And if you put out a quality product, then other people know of you. And then uh, the more other people know of you, the, you know, the more you get requested to cover certain things. Um, and then funny things happen. One time at one of the nights, um, 
the ring announcer didn't make it. And uh, they wanted me to do the ring announcing in one of the fights in Northern California, right? Which half of it, half the fighters were in Spanish. And like, I don't speak Spanish and I think it would have been fine doing it. But um, he eventually last minute ended up showing up, right? So that's what you get for wearing a suit coat to uh, cover the fight sometimes. Is he might be an instant replacement in some other sort of way, right? So when you were getting around in California, was that 2010 or what year was that? That was 2010 to 2015. And then um, I was part of uh, Floyd, May Floyd Mayweather when he was getting ready for, for the Pacquiao fight, which I believe was around March or May in 2015. Um, I was part of his training camp then with a uh, Polish fighter that I brought in named Michał Hudecki, who was a southpaw and sort of could resemble um, uh, Pacquiao style, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I just sort of have stayed current with it. And then uh, the UFC thing, I was actually in Portugal, and I'm like, okay, I want to do a uh, you know, film on the UFC fighters, the, the mixed martial arts, which was a little bit um, different. Like, traditionally, I've always watched, uh, I guess, boxing more than I have mixed martial arts. Um, so it was a bit of a stretch for me, but there was enough people there that had interesting stories that I wanted to incorporate that. And so if you watch After the Cage, which you can watch for free actually on YouTube, um, you'll see some of those stories. Now, how did you make connections with some of the, like, first fighters that you started dealing with? Who were they? Um, I'm trying to remember now if it was, I don't know if it was Miranda. Like, it's, it's hard for me personally to be able to go back and say, okay, I, I contacted this person out of, out of this time and whatever else. I think with Matt Hughes, I think I just reached out to him. And I was just like, hey, um, you know, I, I'm wanting to do this film and whatever else. And surprisingly, he got back to me. And I think I, I was in Portland at the time. So I think within something like 48 hours, we were already doing a video conference call, right? Um, so that's how quick that went. So the ball sort of got rolling with it from there. And then, of course, you know, he's been in the game for, you know, 20 plus years. So he knew plenty of people. Um, so I think Dan Severn was also great to get back with. I think Pat Miltich was the same way. I think Miranda Maverick was the same way. They're, they're, they pretty much, none of them were like, I guess, untouchable, right? But I, I didn't contact them the same way that maybe a fan would. Like, I contacted them with a purpose, and I contacted them with dates that I would be back in the States and I'd be working on something, right? Yeah. So. Cool. Now, for people that haven't seen this film, I mean, after the cage, obviously, you would think this is like life after not fighting. So right. um, in your instance, making the film, maybe without giving away too much, kind of what looking back on it, what's maybe some of your takeaways from this experience of filming these people really famous or, or were big figures in the fight game, a lot of the people you named, but right. no longer competing? Um, I, I mean, I think it's just a, a generalized story of life, and it's something that every single one of us understand. It, like, the fight game is something that people understand. It, it's, it's, you know, I've heard people that come out of the boxing realm that said, you know, a caveman can understand fighting, right? You know what's going on instantly. And I think it's a story of life, maybe, you know, um, put through the lens. And certainly some of the, I guess, I don't want to say tragedies, but the hardships that have met some of these people outside, everything from divorce to, you know, to, I mean, you look at Matt Hughes's situation where he got hit by a train, right? Um, and that's covered in there. And so um, I, I think that with fighters, there's just more that they always put on the risk. So maybe they're bigger risk takers than the average bear, right? Maybe every single time they step in there, they could get, you know, really seriously injured. They could get knocked out. They, they could get even killed for that matter, right? Um, so I, I think that their stories tend to be a little bit like more accentuated than the average person that might live in town and work the same job for 40 years at the factory somewhere, right? But life is filled with tragedy and malevolence, and um, I don't sit there and want to focus on the negative. I think anybody who actually watches this, this film will walk away with a better understanding of, of the fighters that they thought they knew, um, a better understanding of how the competitive market works in the fight game, and also perhaps um, have a better idea of, um, well, just how much they go through and how much they sacrifice, and, and also the fact that you know, you're introduced to a lot of these people on TV and you have pay-per-views, but you don't really see what they're like on the outside, right? And, and I know that sounds like very generic to say that, but anybody who I think would see this um, would, would sort of agree with that. That's the kind of feedback that I've gotten from people, right? Um, from a filmmaker perspective, I think it's always your job to not go in there with a story lined up, but it's more important to maybe take us back seat and be like, okay, this is this person's story. How am I going to be able to convey this message on the camera, right?
So you, documentary work, like you shouldn't go in there with a treatment of how you are going to present everything because quite honestly, oftentimes the story will reveal itself and it might be very different than what you thought it was going to be, right? So, yeah. Now, I forgot what year it was that Matt had, was involved in this accident. Did you meet him before or after? I never met Matt before uh, the accident. I, I, I never met him. I, I really, um, when he was fighting the majority of his fights, I was actually in the Air Force and I was stationed in Korea at that time. And uh, part of the deal that they had with the Armed Forces Network is we would get a lot of those fights mm -hmm. at, at work. So literally, I'd be at work editing video uh, videos because I was a broadcaster for AFN and the Pentagon Channel. And he'd be out in the background, right? And that's so a lot of his fights I saw not, I mean, through pay-per-view, but because the Armed Forces Network a, a lot, you know, allowed us to see them. And there was enough of a time difference that people were watching that 11 p.m. and whatever else. And that lunchtime we were watching it there was about a 12 to 13 hour difference in South Korea, right? Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I certainly saw interviews with him and I was familiar with him, but I hadn't, I, I was surprised the first time we had spoken because, you know, it wasn't, the same voice that I remembered, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Because well, I really haven't seen a lot of interviews of him or anything of him talking since then. I've seen a little bit. Was Were you able to communicate with him pretty easily? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think his, his uh, speech is a little bit slower before, and he, I think, still struggles with certain things like diction and articulation. Um, so... Uh, but quite honestly, I mean, you know, English is not my first language. I probably still struggle with that a little bit, right? So there, there's that. Um, but yeah, if you watch the segment on him, it's there's a lot of raw parts in there. And I wanted to keep it raw. I didn't want to overproduce it. I think when I uh, cut into his story, it, it literally starts at the train tracks. And then it goes from there to um, me just asking him a couple questions about does he remember the accident and everything else and just allowing him to speak. So... There's, there's quite a few moments in there where he's just talking and, and, and telling his story. Now, I know you had, like you said, you mentioned Dan Sever and Pat Militich, kind of. Sure. What were your impressions of covering some of those guys? So it, it's interesting. Dan Sever, and I remember being 14 years old the first time I watched Dan. And uh, this was back when the UFC almost went out of business, and there was three VHS cassettes. And I was, you know, I'd go down and I'd be visiting my dad in St. Charles, which is this little town outside of Saginaw, Michigan. It's probably 28 miles outside of there. And all the labels were the same. So I think a couple of times I rented the same damn VHS cassette and I was so angry at myself, right? Because it's like, I just watched this last weekend or something, but it didn't matter because, you, you know, you put it on and back then there was no time limit. So the fights could go over an hour or something. Um, they're just down to earth, great guys. I mean, honestly, uh, the majority of fighters, and, and, and I've heard this said, uh, Layla McCarter, if, if you know, she is a professional female boxer uh, outside of Las Vegas, Nevada. I think she said it best one time we were speaking and she said, you know, she goes, outside of the ring, we have nothing to prove, right? Um, and, and I think there is there's some sort of truth to that. It, it's, uh, uh, they don't, you know, I, I've heard some of the rudest people are actually baseball players. Now, I haven't met that many, but even from the fighters I know, they, they heard, you know, they said baseball players. And it's like, well, you know, maybe that's true. I mean, I, I've been to one baseball game my whole life, so I, I, I didn't really meet any and, and not really overly interested in meeting any, if that makes sense, right? Um, but they're all great, man. I, I mean, Pat Militich, last year, I ended up spending Thanksgiving with him because I don't really celebrate any holidays. I happen to be driving around, and, and I, I'm like, hey, Pat, what are you doing? He's like, well, it's Thanksgiving. Why don't you come over for dinner? And I said, uh, okay, you know what I mean? So that just gives you an, an idea of what kind of people they actually are. Um, they're, they're professionals. Um, they still, after all these years, I mean, if they weren't professional, they wouldn't have attained and achieved what they had achieved and attained, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I say that because it's like, you know, anytime we made a plan to meet somewhere to film or when they came up to Saginaw for the film opening, like they were on time and everybody was great to work with. There's not a single person that I wouldn't want to work with again, right? Um, I still talk to all of them. Um, it might be sporadic. They've got full schedules. I do too. But it's like, I don't think anybody, I think in, no, nobody would have anything but positive things to say about anybody that was involved. I'll say that. Now, when you had the opening, like I, they have a, a movie theater here in Tulsa called Circle Cinema, which was kind of featured in The Outsiders. I don't know if you've seen The Outsiders. With, I haven't. That was like Tom Cruise's first film and Patrick Swayze was in it, Emilio Estevez. Ralph okay. All these famous actors i'll have to send you a clip of it but here in tulsa that's where it's filmed but they have a kind of like a non-profit theater that does a lot of those kind of things that you're talking about openings of like documentary films and whatnot so what was uh 
like did you guys do question and answer and things like that there no we didn't do a question and answer we did a meet and greet afterwards so everybody came up and they watched the film and i mean there, there probably were questions and answers afterwards because the line sometimes would, would slow up a little bit and people would be getting photos and everything but um everybody got to meet them i think that the at the opening of it i think something like during the first showing I want to say it was, it was you know, we, we had limited capacity because it was still during COVID. So it was a little bit risky, right? Um, so some people weren't still going out, but I, I think we were still around the three or 400 mark. And um, everybody was able to meet the fighters afterwards and people got photos and they bought autographed merchandise. And, um, but I did, I, you know, the whole question and answer thing, like I think the film answered most of the questions, at least the ones that it posed. Um, so people were just able to go up and, and just sort of enjoy their one-on-one -on -one time with everybody. And I thought that was a little more personal than, than having a panel up there with everybody holding a mic and, you know, going back and forth and everything. So I, I think the majority of people that, that showed up would have preferred the way that we did it, right? And what yeah. was the feedback? Was it more, was there like, was it mostly fight fans or was it kind of mixed and maybe mixed? Interesting. Um, some people were, were fight fans. Um, they certainly came there with like old UFC gear. I mean, I remember one guy, he brought his wrestling shoes from high school and he wanted all the fighters to sign them and everything like that. That was his little, you know, you know momentum piece that was different for everybody. Um, the majority, some people are just avid film goers and they're going to come to any film. I mean, if you made a film on grass, they'd show up to it. Right. But I think the majority of people probably knew at least one or two of the people that, that were featured in that film. Right. And if they weren't current uh, people that, that watch the UFC, they certainly did in the past. And so it holds a certain, you know, uh, maybe soft spot in their hearts, right? Now, where did you hold the, the uh, premiere? So I hold the premiere in Saginaw, Michigan. I actually open a lot of films in Saginaw. There's a, a theater there uh, run by some really wonderful people. And um, they just, we've, we've had a really good working relationship. I've even thought in the future about putting a film festival up there that would be localized to the universities that are there and feature local people and even, uh, you know, have certain age groups. Because I think now, you know, unlike when I went to high school about 20 some years ago, they actually have film schools now, right? Like high school students have editing suites and they're making videos for the classes. And, and so, you know, ultimately it's, it, I mean, the good news is that there should be like a future with a lot of good filmmakers, right? Because they, you know, they've been doing it for a lot longer than everybody else. They have access to things. So, um, so it's like, why not give them an area where their stuff can be viewed? And um, so that's one thing that I'm working on in the future here about starting a festival like that, where, where you know, you might have uh, fifth through seventh grade or, you know, seventh through ninth or whatever else, or maybe every grade. And, and you know, you'd have shorts and other sorts of music videos and people could come and even, even vote on them. So people in the audience could actually vote on whatever it is. Right. Um, but the theater is, is the core street theater. The people there that, love, that run it are, are wonderful. I've had a great working relationship with them. And um, there was a bigger theater I opened up in Saginaw before, but, you know, uh, it's uh, after opening up at this one, it's it's small, it's intimate, and and quite honestly, I think it's something like 400 and some seats. So you know, if you're doing a meet and greet, that's so much better than a place that's got 1600 seats in it, right? Because mm -hmm. if you had a meet and greet with 1600 seats, and let's say you filled it even at 80 percent capacity, you know, people would be there for three or four hours, and not everybody wants to sit there and wait in line for that, right? With um with 70, 80 percent capacity at 400. I, you know, everybody saw everybody they needed to see in them an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes, and a lot of people were still invigorated when they walked out of there, and they were thankful and they were happy, and it just worked out well. So, I wonder, have you seen like Bobby Razik, for example, made a lot of move, you know, kind of documentaries about MMA, short, long. Um, was there anyone else that you watched, or was it just something that you you don't watch that kind of stuff? It's this. You're gonna probably find think, think this is funny. Um, I probably haven't owned a TV in seven years. I don't watch any TV. Um, I don't. I don't. I used to work in news. I think it's all. You know, how blunt can I be on this program? As blunt as you want, please. I mean, I mean, you can drop f bombs and everything, or what? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, American news is absolute fucking horseshit. I mean, we got the worst jackasses of all jackasses, and and I don't care if you're standing on the liberal or conservative side. The, the news here isn't worth two shits, right? The, right. the last people that we had, in my opinion, that were even newsworthy and they could call themselves broadcasters were the Troika, Peter Jennings, and uh, Dan Rather, and um, uh, who's the other guy I'm forgetting? And not uh, Tom Brokaw, I think. Those were the three that were left, right? And after those three died, it just all went to shit, you know? Died or retired or, or moved on. Um, and so, um, you know, if you find me watching any TV, it's probably reruns of Unsolved Mysteries with the Robert Stack episodes that were produced in the 80s and 90s. 
And I, I go back even further watching uh, black and white episodes of The Twilight Zone, right? Yeah, but like, dude, new new shows and new actors, I don't know any of them. Like, I mean, if I, I mean, I know Anthony Hopkins and, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio, but some of these people that are out there, like, I, I've heard the names, but if I was standing next to them at Starbucks, I wouldn't even know who they are, right? But as a filmmaker, how do you get ideas for what you're going to do? Because I think, I think the human story is just the human story. I think it's always going to be the, the same thing. It's like, how do you get ideas? Well, what book do you pick up? What, what do you find that's of interest? And I would say probably a good 95% you know, of what's out there is just nonsense. I mean, people worry about like, you know, I get on the internet today. I get on my phone and they're talking about, it was one of the Kardashians, some new garbanzo that she's dating with some tattoos on his neck or something like that, right? Right. It's like, really, who gives a shit? You, you know, people are going to spend five minutes reading the story or however long it is, but they're like, they're not going to look at, you know, investing in stocks. They're not going to sit there and wonder what kind of investments they should make or where they should, like, make a, a better effort in their own lives or maybe get into shape or lower their cholesterol or, or do something positive for themselves, but they're going to get involved in some celebrity li livelihood type thing, right? It's just, it's just the nonsensical type of stuff that continually throws you off of whatever you should be working towards, right? Wow. So to me, movies, for the most part, um, and I hate to say this because as a filmmaker, it sounds counterproductive, but they're, they're a, a huge waste of time. And so it's like, how do you how do you then justify it? Well, hopefully within that time, you can say that whatever you made was hopefully educational, but also entertaining. Right. Mm -hmm. So news used to be here. Here's the here's the th one way I've heard it put that I would agree with. I think news used to be they would take things that were important and try to make them interesting. And now they take things that are interesting and try to make them important. Okay. So now you see, you know, like, I don't give a shit what somebody, some celebrity like war to some film premiere or whatever else. You know what I mean? I would like, you'd actually have to pay me to go to these things. You know what I mean? And I'm, I'm a bit of a strange duck in that sort of way, just because of the kind of things that people enjoy, like, I'm not really a fan of anything, right? I don't go to concerts. I don't go to shows. There's no celebrity I want to meet. Like, you would actually have to pay me to go to a concert. So there's no band that I would pay to go to. You'd have to pay me to go to, to a concert. You know what I mean? So, yeah. So when you stories, you know, are, are of interest, it's like um, human interest pieces, you know, um, you'd make a great documentary piece. Cause here's this guy that I don't know much about who started like a podcast type thing. And I don't know what your background is. I don't know if it's in radio. I don't know if you want to be in radio. I don't know if it's a side job or, or whatever else. I mean, you know, there's like plenty of things that I'd love to be able to ask you if I was coming out with a camera to interview you, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. guess so. I mean. Right. Yeah. And, and so, and, and that's and that's how it starts out. And it's like, you know, you look at your background. It's like, you've got a, a, is it a photo of a submarine up there or no? I was a submariner in the Navy. Actually, this stuff my dad had. But my father passed away um, a couple of years ago. He had it in his office, you know, at his house, at my, my parents' house. When he passed away, I took it and put it here in my home. Um, so this is kind of like my little office. So I have like some stuff over here, and then I have like a – he was a big Alabama football fan, so the wall behind – this way that you can't see, it's all Alabama stuff. And then I have okay. over here on the right. Um, but, yeah, I was a submariner, you know, and uh, so that was the first one I was on. And, Very cool. And then I swords I got – I left you. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you see, this is what I'm saying. So you're like, you know, how do you develop a story? It's like, look at a person and, and uh, you know, people watch at airports and it's like a lot of a lot of stuff you can sort of like put together from people. And then, the, you know, the big thing is ask questions. I'm always asking questions, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, I, I find that generally the majority of, you know, people watch shows for, for different reasons. I'll say this. And the majority of, I think, people who watch TV, not just in the United States, but in the world, do it as a form of escapism, right? Like, they want to be entertained. They don't want to necessarily think through much through it. They don't want the same level of brain activity that you would get reading, you know, Dostoevsky or something like that, right? They have a long, shitty job. They probably don't like their job. They've got kids that, you know, that they're tired of. They've got a dog that just took a dump in the house and they're smelling that, but they don't want to get up, you know, before they choke down whatever pasta, you know, dish that they made for dinner. And they want to turn something on for half an hour. They want to like mentally be not present in their, their current life. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I don't think I make films for the masses. You know, um, I, I don't want to sell out and do things that are, you know, a lot of the stuff that I do is information heavy in their, in their, um, um, how can I say this? 
it's information heavy and it's one of those things where I don't tell easy stories. If you look back at the films I've produced, there's stuff on addiction. There's stuff that when I talk about people who prostitute themselves out because their addiction was so bad, there's stuff on suicide, military suicide. Actually, I have a film called 22 that you should definitely see that got banned um, on Amazon after being on for a year. I think you being a veteran would uh, completely appreciate that because there are some veteran stories that are in there. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't tackle the easy things, right? Um, I, I'm, I'm currently working on a five projects actually, and one of them that's probably going to be the next one released is, uh, you know, one on a wrestling promotion. Um, and, and this promotion has been around for 20 some odd years and, and it existed in Saginaw and it's sort of the story of them crawling their way back into existence after the whole COVID shutdown. Right. Uh, and they recently signed a pay-per-view deal. So, so that's, you know, they're, they're only going to get larger from, from where they are right now. Another of the films that I have with some of the most hardcore women that I've ever met, actually, uh, that probably rival even some of the professional MMA fighters as a film on ballet, believe it or not, right? Um, is, these women are hardcore, and a lot of them can be really conniving and backstabbing and, you know, do, do the kind of stuff where, like, it's not uncommon where you hear about one ballerina putting, like, broken glass in another one's shoes be like before she has to dance an audition or something like that, mm -hmm. right? So I, I don't tackle easy stories. I think if a story is easily told, then it probably – isn't of that much interest at least it isn't to me you know so uh it may be for the wrong reasons for people and everything like that but but you know you, you pose a good question it's like well how do you how do you choose what to, what to tell a story on and everything like that i mean shit i, I think i could do a documentary on, on five different people who have asked me to be like on their podcasts and how the hell they came to being right and that would be interesting enough right just be putting together different pieces so no but as a filmmaker if you don't <clears throat> if you don't make films for the masses, which is fine, right? But how do you, if you're doing it for like, I mean, I guess if you're doing it as a hobby, it wouldn't matter, right? But if you're doing it for a living, how do you make enough income to where it's worth your while to do it? So I do a couple things and all of them are very costly, right? And um, I fly airplanes. So I probably spend about, you know, $2,500 a month on flying, um, renting airplanes and flying them because I'm still building my hours. So I should take a job as a, as a pilot, right? Um, I paint. So I have an art gallery space and I do oil paintings and I also make films. Those are really the top three things that I do. Um, all of them take a large amount of time, which cuts into my sleep. All of them uh, take a large amount, amount of time and commitment. And the way that I justify doing them, because sometimes you don't make returns on a film for like a year or two, right? The way that I justify being able to do it is I believe that if you're a creative person, you are going to create regardless of where you are. So if you get locked in a Cuban prison somewhere, you're going to still be making little sculptures or whatever else, even though it might be out of sand or broken crayons, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the majority of people in life sort of have this, I don't want to say a false pretense, but they're set up in a way where they say, um, well, I'm going to try this, and if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. And, and yet, you have to redefine success because it's like the question is, for myself anyway, how do you define success, right? If you define it from financial means, then I shouldn't be doing any of the three things that I'm doing because none of them, you know, I should be at the stock market and investing and doing everything else. But let me ask you this. Was Van Gogh successful? Yeah, for sure. Well, I in his lifetime... In his lifetime, he only sold one painting, and it was to his psychologist, and they had chicken scratches because they used it to, you know, cover up a hole in a chicken coop next to the house, right? Right. So his painting was worth less than a piece of wood back in his time, right? Right. So sometimes what you have to do is what is meaningful and not what is expedient, and that's how I justify being a filmmaker. What stories grab you? What, which ones are worth telling? And I think the films that I've made are only going to get more popular in time. Um, because I, I think the stories are sort of eternal. Like we can look back at the opioid crisis in 30 years from now, which I don't think it's going to be fixed anytime soon. And people are still going to be dying and overdosing. And you can go back to my film Saganatic and see people that, that had essentially gone through that. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think I'm here because like I was telling you about this outsiders movie, which is like required reading and all these different schools. Right. Okay. I don't know if you ever read it when you're in school. I haven't. Basically, it's still required reading today. And uh, a lady here, Essie Hint, well, her name's Susan Eloise Hinton, but they called her Essie Hinton because they didn't think any guys would buy the book if it was written by Susan Eloise Hinton. So it's kind of about, uh, kind of like culture clash or uh, more like a, the haves and have-nots, right? She wrote it in high school. She's okay. 
<clears throat> and this guy uh, from the rap group House of Pain, I don't know if you've ever heard of them. They're I know of them, yeah. Yeah, so his name is Danny O'Connor, and they were touring here. They came to Tulsa. I think he had maybe three days off, so he was looking for stuff to do. And uh, he found out that The Outsiders was filmed here. And there's a the house in the movie. And he went there and visited it. And it was falling apart, you know, they were getting ready to demo it, basically, to put up Habitat for Humanity. And uh, he was kind of looking into buying it, but he didn't buy it at first. But uh, every year when they came back to Tulsa, he'd check it out again. It was worse and worse and worse, you know. So he had his friend from, like, L.A. call the owners and just inquire. Well, the guy ended up buying the house. He didn't, he didn't inquire. He he called Danny and said, okay, I bought the house. You owe me 15 grand or whatever it was they bought it for. So he bought the house. He's fixed it up. He's turned it into a museum, you know. So he has this museum because he was a fan of this movie, you mm -hmm. know. And Tulsa's kind of, it's kind of that uh, movie, the theater. They do tours on it. People come and visit the house all the time. He's kind of, he made an Airbnb across the street. So he's kind of like, building this kind of like outsiders neighborhood of sorts and it's not necessarily in a great area so it's kind of an interesting story i don't know maybe it's something you'd find interesting or not but yeah i mean it's it's a human interest piece i i mean like i said i'm, I'm working on five different things right now i i always like hearing about um, I, I haven't heard of the outsiders thing i mean i'd be interested if you want to send me a message after we're done with this today like i'll certainly look into it when i do have time which is pretty limited right okay. um I read for probably about an hour and a half a day. So the time that people spend watching TV, I literally read, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, I try to read every day. And sometimes it's studying stuff or like flying gliders or flying planes or, or, or different things. And sometimes it's just philosophical stuff. And sometimes it's, but very, like I'm, I've been sort of separated from the mainstream culture now for probably, ooh, I'd say a good five to eight years, right? And I, I've been more content, I, you know, uh, funny enough through it, I, I would say. I mean, I, I lived in Portugal probably three out of the last five years. And um, obviously, I don't have American TV there. So I was really disconnected. And even the stories on Facebook, some of the stuff in the European Union, you weren't allowed to see. So being in Portugal, like I'd click on a story that somebody shared from my hometown and like I wouldn't even see, I wouldn't be able to even read it, right? Um, but I think a human interest story is a human interest story. And I think those aren't going to change. And there's a certain format to those and they're always going to be there. And it's like, you know, you can pick something. It's like, what's of interest or, or what do you find that's interesting? And um, you go ahead and, 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 and it's like what people will tell that. Right. Um, yeah. I, I think that's the best way I can put it. I'm curious about one thing. I know you're from Poland or that. Yeah. Uh, the war that's going on in Ukraine. What, what, what do you, I want your, uh, your your kind of take on everything. So I'm, I'm going to warn you, I'm pretty blunt with things, right? Mm -hmm. um, personally, I'll tell you, this is from personal experience, just an observation. It's not what I, what I necessarily will say, but it's just what I've observed. I think the majority of Eastern Europeans don't differentiate much between neither Ukrainians or Russians. They don't see much of a difference. Um, there's a longer history here than a lot of people want to admit to. And what I mean by that is I think in the 1920s, when Russia took over the Ukraine, which, by the way, the Ukraine has also always been the, the sort of the breadbasket of Europe. I mean, I think they have something like 40 million people and they grow enough food to, to like feed about 330. Right. So they have an 800 percent surplus. Yeah. Do they have grapes and, and pineapples? Well, no, but they have enough grain and, and beef and everything else to feed people. Right. Um, when Russia took over during the, you know, uh, the fall of the Romanov Empire, and this is the 1920s. Um, I think it was something like 6 million Ukrainians ended up starving in the first five to six years, right? So about a million people a year. Um, a lot of people don't talk about that, that history. Um, but also what's important to annotate is the fact that when the Chechens were going to war with Russia, the Ukrainians actually helped the Chechens out. And the Ukrainians also, and this is in the 90s and stuff with Milosevic and those other guys. And a lot of the Russian soldiers at that time that were captured were literally castrated and sent back to, to Russia. So they cut their balls off and they sent them back. A lot of these guys committed suicide and did other things, which also left a pretty bad taste in uh, a lot of people's mouths, there, right, in Russia. So um, 
I have a hard time when I see people that are suffering. I've seen a little bit of war in my life and, and war-torn areas and certainly traveled to third world countries. Um, I've, I've been to places like Cuba two or three times um, and I brought supplies there and you know, I've, I've been to other places also. Um, it's hard for me to, to justify any action that, that deals with people that are you know, suffering that aren't really um, part of whatever regime that you're trying to overthrow. But by the same token, I know Ukraine, for the most part, to be one of the most corrupt damn places you could possibly ever be in, right? You know, people talk about in the United States corruption here with police officers and this and that. And it's nothing compared to what it is over there. I mean, to give you an idea, I had a friend that flew to the Ukraine and at the airport, they pretty much asked me, he said, well, how much money are you bringing in? And he said, well, I have $750. I mean, they're like, okay, we'll take it. So they literally took $750 for him to be able to get in the country, right? When you have a regime that's run that way, um that's a really animalistic thing and it's like that's the owner of the airport that's doing that right that's literally your representative i'm coming into the country i'm sorry but shit like that just needs to be wiped clean so am, am i a, a fan of unnecessary people suffering no uh but by the same token sometimes things need to fall and, and when you're a citizen of a country you're also responsible for where that country stands right so I actually don't have much of an opinion one way or the next. It's just things that I've observed for a while, right? Um, the regular tearjerker stories of, of people sitting there and showing me that, you know, children are born in basements and this and that. It's like, you know what? That's happening everybody, everywhere else in the world, right? I'm not overly empathetic to it just because it's happening there, right? So, um, yeah, I, I, it hasn't, I, I don't, you know, it's like, well, Russia attacks. It's like, well, no shit. They've been doing that for the last 500 years since they were Russians. That's what they always do. Right. Mm -hmm. And not a popular opinion, because I've said this with other people. Um, I mean, even though I'm like 96, 97 percent Polish and 2 percent, 2 percent Ashkenazi Jew, um, you know, Poland right now has allowed uh, other countries to use their airports to actually bring in bombers and bring in other sorts of things. Right. If those airports get bombed, I understand. I'm not saying I condone it. I just understand because that's an act of war. You're you're literally contributing to war over there right regardless of how you agree to it regardless of where your loyalty lies it's like when you are playing an active role you're playing an active role right um and by the way i plan on going to russia soon i mean i've, I've got to film on ballerinas obviously there's no way i can produce that and not go to russia right so i'm just hoping this just blows over so i can fly into moscow and finish up what i need to do you know personally that's how it's putting a pain in my ass right but i think it goes What's that? How far do you think this goes? Uh, I mean, we're ex-military guys. I'm curious. Yeah. I don't think, well, first of all, let me say this. It's hard for a lot of people to find out what the end game is. It's like, well, what does Putin essentially want? And I don't think it's been necessarily made clear. And I also, some of these weapons that people use, people lose, people just let me say this lose perspective of the fact that some of these weapons may cost more to actually decommission than it is to just send off somewhere and bomb something, right? Mm -hmm. So he might be doing this as just saving money. You know what I mean? I hate to say it that way because it sounds brutal, but th there's a certain truth to that. Um, I don't see... I think it just ends in more bloodshed because I, I think that even if the regime falls, I think what you're going to see is a lot of... Uh, you know, I think you're going to see a lot of street fighting and a lot of people losing their lives in the very near future. And, you know, a lot of there's a lot of Russians I know who like studied in Ukraine and a lot of Ukrainians that studied in Russia. And, um, you know, they're they're really hard to separate. It's, it's almost to me like Florida and Texas trying to break off from the United States and then say, like, if Texas came to the, the U.S. and said, well, look, we're only going to sell our beef. If you want to buy our beef, you have to go through Mexico. Right. And Florida is saying, if you want to buy our oranges, you have to go through Cuba now. Right. And then the United States coming back and saying, well, you're connected to us, so no way in hell we're doing that, right? So it's a little more complex than I've seen it explained. Um, I don't know if there is a clear end to it. You know, if, if you're going to put on a quote-unquote death toll on something, I, I, I don't think those, like, the lines are so much more gray today than they've ever been in life. It's not like World War II where you have the axis of evil and you know exactly what they're fighting for and, and you know exactly why the American military is going over there. Things have... For the last good, probably, wars that America's fought in the last 25 years, they've been really undefined terms as far as what goals are, specifics. And then it's like, well, how do you win a war then if you don't even know what the hell you're, you're actually trying to accomplish there, right? So 
Um, I think one of the bigger mistakes that certainly, you know, you talk about being a war guy, uh, you know, Biden pulling out of the Afghanistan the way that he did and leaving things there the way that he did. I mean, I talk to guys that are in the military that are completely demoralized because it feels like the last 20 years of being there, people have died in vain and for no reason. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I don't see a, a, a clean, a clean break on anything. I don't think Putin, you know, and here's the one thing to consider. I heard in Poland a rumor about 15 years ago that Putin was severely ill, right? And I don't mean mentally ill, I mean like health issues, right? Does that change anything? I mean, if, if you're the kind of person who's dying, like, you know, Kim Jong-un or Kim Jong-il, if, if they were literally, if they were dying and they, they're sitting there and they don't have an heir and they have a red button where they could go and like, you know, light 30 you know, million people up, but basically make everybody else suffer right along with them. And they don't believe in God and they you know, don't know where they're going to next. And they don't believe in, you know, heaven or hell or whatever else. It's like, that's, that's a bit of a wild card, right? Yeah. It makes things a, a little more interesting. Um, but me seeing Ukrainians sit there and suffer and die. I mean, it, it's, it's no worse than seeing Russians sit there and suffer and die or Africans sit there and suffer and die. It, it sucks, but that's also a piece of humanity, unfortunately, right? We haven't necessarily yet learned how to resolve our differences with, with you know, with, with a peaceful outcome. Um, that's, that's a huge failure that, that we've done. And part of the reason, I, I've said this before, going back to the fight game, how this is related to it. I think boxing and even bare knuckle fighting is probably one of the most sophisticated sports. And the reason I say that is because it doesn't pretend to be anything else. You understand exactly what it is. Uh, the societies that have existed where they've tried to ban violence have actually become the most violent. Those are the ones that actually kill people. Off. Matter of fact, if you read a book by, um, it was the an, uh, American ambassador to Germany, right? Before World War II, uh, Henry Dodd was his name. He actually talked about how the rules in, in Germany were so good that people would have loved to have been like a dog or a German shepherd because they had animal rights rules that actually are better than we have in America right now for, for protecting animals, right? Mm -hmm. And yet they melted down and gassed 6 million people, you know? So it, it, it's, you know, it, it's an interesting thing. Um, I don't think we know the full story. I don't think we, we know the full picture. Uh, I, I think it's a little asinine when I've heard, you know, Sean Penn come out there and be like, oh, yeah, you know, 30 to $300 million, which a billionaire could pay for, could have Ukraine win this war and this and that. And it's like, Jesus, you know what I mean? I, 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 some of these Hollywood jackasses, it's part of the reason I don't even like Hollywood or movies, because I look at these people like literal jackasses, you know? It's like you're literally a, mon a, a grinder monkey, right, is what you are if you're an actor. I mean, no disrespect to some of the people who do amazing roles, but you're a grinder monkey. You go on stage and you perform for the rest of the audience, right? Mm -hmm. You don't know shit about living in the regular world and you don't know shit about military stuff at all, right? You playing some general doesn't make you a military expert in any single way, right? I'm far from it. I mean, I did seven years in the military. I'm no military expert, you know? I'm, I can't tell you about strategy and plans. I can tell you what happened in the past, and that's just from more so reading books and seeing historically what kind of stuff repeats itself. But, um, yeah. Uh, it, it's become a great excuse in America also for a lot of things that are sort of being handled in a very lackluster manner, right? It's like, oh, gas is prices. Oh, it's the war in Ukraine, this and that. It's like, oh, really? You know, is that what it is, right? That's why it went up a buck 30 or whatever it's gone up, right? So um, I haven't really watched much of, I can't even call it the news, but manipulations on how they try to sell it to us. That, that's my answer. That's, is, that, is that a good enough answer? Did I answer that or no? Yeah, I mean, I was curious about your perspective because obviously you're from poland you've been involved yeah. in the news which is being used to kind of <clears throat> you know in the west side it's kind of to say they're losing you know the russians are losing the russians are losing the russians are losing you know that's kind of what you hear from the news every day the russians are losing their you know they're losing this war you know and then <clears throat> so it's kind of it, it's an interesting uh kind of like you were talking so, about, not necessarily, you know, it's BS, you know. To and the people that say the Russians are losing, let me just remind them of one thing. In World War II, with the sophisticated German military and the ability to fight wars like Blitzkriegs, which they had the ability to do that, right? Russians, what, what usually they did is they sent the first person out with a gun that wasn't loaded, right? The second person had ammo, and the third person had nothing. And when the first two got shot, the third person put together the gun and the ammunition. It was able to fire back a single bullet, right? And they still won. 
So they can have, I'm, I'm sorry, but you're dealing with Russians. They can have four times as many people dying for every Ukrainian. It's a numbers game, right? And at the end of the day, it's like, I, I, when I hear these people saying, oh, well, they're, they're, they're winning. They're, it's almost like, how can I compare it to? Uh, like you have, you, you know, you're playing basketball with somebody, you have t 10 balls to score as many points as, as you want to, and they have an unlimited amount of balls, right? Yeah. So they only shoot 10% as good as you do, or 20% as good as you do, but they can sit there at the three point line all day and launch a hundred balls. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I just, I, I don't, I don't buy it. I, I think it's nonsensical. I don't buy it. And when I see stupid things, like people like, Again, the celebrity nonsense stuff. Like people like Angelina Jolie, I saw she was in Ukraine because one of my Russian ballerinas, who's actually uh, the, the one I know from the Bolshoi, she actually works as a prostitute and she's proud of it, right? So she's an interesting person to get an interview from because she doesn't pretend that she's, you know, something that she isn't. Again, another one of those tough girls, right? And um, she basically, you know, posts on there. She's like, like, what the hell is this person here for? So my thing is this. If some stupid American celebrity like Sean Penn, Angelina Jolie, they go out to Ukraine where there's an active war and they get blown up, I don't give a shit. You know what I mean? If it's a war zone, you don't belong there, right? And then secondly, it makes me believe it's not really that bad of a war zone then, and it's just manipulations because if it were, why the hell would you be going there? Right. You know? So I was looking between the lines. I'm, I'm, I'm very careful, you know, and, and, you know, they repackage the same stories over and over and over to try to, like, hit your emotions. So one way of hitting your emotions is showing dogs suffering there. Because it's like, well, maybe you hate people, but you love dogs, right? So let's show how many German shepherds are like, you know, not getting taken care of and abandoned, right? And that'll plug on people's heartstrings. You have to be logical in these things. And anytime you have emotion that's infused there, the logic goes out the window, right? So when news starts selling me on the emotions of things, I already know that the logic has been lost. Yeah, that, it's interesting perspective. I think it's a good thing to kind of end the interview on. Because as we're kind of winding down here, I do want to, sure. uh, <clears throat> for people that are, I know you're working on a lot of projects. Maybe you could tell people about some of them and maybe where they could follow some of what you're doing. Yeah. So, I mean, distribution has become a, a more and more, uh, I don't want to say difficult thing. The last thing that people would be, um, I, I mean, I've got a couple films on Amazon. I think if they looked up Sag and Addicts, they, they probably, it's on Google Play and a couple other places that they could probably get it from. Um, like I said, after the cage is on YouTube, so people can just watch it on there. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the projects. So the next film, probably two films that I'll be releasing this year. Um, well, one is contingent on me actually going to Russia, like I just said. So that's going to depend on when this whole, you know, all these shenanigans sort of end, or at least when I can get a flight from the United States to Moscow or St. Petersburg. And, um, and two, uh, you know, the next one that I have coming out is going to be, uh, I haven't even titled it yet but it's going to be on this wrestling uh thing right uh people that are professional wrestlers and what that takes and i think that's a different breed of individual also right that goes through and does that because it's an interesting thing even dan severn touched on this he said i've been hurt more in the professional wrestling ring than i ever have in any cage fights right mm -hmm. so it's it's almost like accentuated acting, right? I mean, you're 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 dramatizing getting hit and getting injured and having to sell the other guy's moves and this and that. But yet, I mean, the injuries are very real. With what happens, right? And they're pretty risky. And um, yeah, people can follow me on Instagram. Uh, people can follow me on. Um, I mean, I'm on Facebook and everything like that. I guess they can they can follow me on there. Uh, but uh, but yeah, um, there was another project that actually. Uh, somebody had recently been talking to me about um, it was actually co-producing something with Keanu Reeves, right? And it was a documentary about somebody that we knew, but I'm still waiting to hear on that. So I usually don't like bringing stuff up up until, you know, you know, the time that things get released or whatever else, right? But I try not to talk about too many things because I think it pulls energy away from it, actually, right? Yeah. But, but I've got, you know, tens of tens of hundreds of uh, uh, boxing promos that are out there, um, seven documentary films that are out there. Um, I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, my last name is Jupina, by the way. I know you said Zubina, which a lot of people say, right? But um, if you if you have it spelled on there, it's pretty easy to find. And, and Google, and uh, they can find stuff, right? Right. Yeah. Well, Luca, I appreciate you taking time to do this. I know you're busy and all that, you know. And uh, Thank you. I'm actually on vacation now in Miami, believe it or not. Oh, yeah. That's, that's a good spot. So, yeah. Especially What's that? That's a good spot to be for MMA right now. That's like the hotbed, right? 
I mean, I just uh, do you do you know uh, like um, Joey Beltran and uh, Britton Hart? Yeah, Britton Beltran. So I just had lunch with them what two days ago now, and uh, I'm probably filming them either t tomorrow or the day after, right? Mm -hmm. So they're, they're sharing a, a part of that story. But yeah, my, Miami's pretty fun, man. It's a, I mean, I wouldn't want to live here because it's a little too hot for me. I'm built for cold climates, you know what I mean? I'm dying down here, right? Um, but to visit a couple times a year and just get away from Michigan, it's not so bad. Yeah, and as a pilot, you can just kind of fly around anywhere you want, pretty much. <laughs> Absolutely, right? Even in shitty weather, so. <laughs> All right, well. Cool. It was great talking to you. And like I said, I appreciate you taking the time, especially I couldn't do this without people like you that are willing to do it. And uh, Yeah, thank you. And, uh, you know, let me know if you need anything going moving forward and whatever else. And thanks for having me on. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad we got to find a time to make it work out. So, yeah. And if you ever come to Tulsa, if you ever fit their small airports here that you can fly into. So. Yeah, I'm trying to think. It's like, what would I be doing out there? Storm chasing or looking at tornadoes or something like that, right? Usually that's like. Yeah, yeah, that might be. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's that's another potential thing that I might be doing in the future now that we're talking about it, right? I've talked to a few people and like I want to make sure people have been doing it for at least ten years and survived before I do you know, I don't want to be on there on the first year film crew. It's like, oh yeah, we're storm chasers. And it's like, how long have you been doing this? And it's like, oh, we just put together our truck last week. And it's like, yeah, let me go with that more experienced team here. You know what I mean? I might so. be yeah. I'm sure there's plenty What's that? There's plenty of them around here, so I might be able to find some experienced ones. Just give me some that have been alive for more than 10 years. See, that's a documentary we could co-produce right there, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's how these things come into fruition. That's how these things come into being. It's people talking. So. Yeah, it sounds like a good idea. Awesome. All right, dude. Enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you again. You too. It was great meeting you and great talking with you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Cheers.